so how is it that a Presbyterian pastor goes to Iraq for Arba'in? I had no idea a year ago how my life would change. And what I want to speak about this evening is how is it that a Christian minister from Portland is speaking to a room, for, room full of Shias in Orange County? <laughs> Salam Alaikum. It really is, it is an honor to be, I really can't believe it. I, I appreciate uh, the hospitality uh, taken to, to lunch today. Uh, uh, the flying down here, it is really, uh, thank you. Thank you, it is really an honor to be here. Sayyid Mustafa asked me to speak about how this trip came to be. He wanted me to talk, he said, he had 35 minutes, talk about how, what led to taking this trip. Um, and that sounds like an, an easy question, but it's actually a very deep question um, because it is asking of me to tell you who I am, to be vulnerable, am I for real? And what I'm going to tell you is, is what I've seen and, and what I've heard, and I'm obviously speaking for myself. I do not speak uh, for obviously for this center. No one in this center knows what I'm going to say. I don't speak for my congregation, I don't speak for anyone except for me. This is me and me alone. And I tell my congregation all the time, you will disagree with me at times, and that's okay. I think it's important to speak from the heart and listen from the heart. The other thing I tell my congregation is this. I'm 57 years old. My granddaughter, Pippa, is two. My overriding concern is what will the world be like when Pippa is 57? And what am I doing about that now? And of course, not just my granddaughter, Pippa, but all two-year-olds all around the world. What are we leaving? What are we doing and saying now so there will be a world for all of our babies, a world that is sustainable, a world that is just, a world that is peaceful. So why did I touch the shrine of Imam Hussein alayhi salam? Hussein is needed in this country. I love this country, I was born here. My ancestry goes back many generations on this soil. But we have some big problems. And I have a critique. And it's related to why I went. I'll talk about what led me to take the walk from Najaf to Karbala for Arba'in and, and what that walk has meant to me and, and why what I think Imam Hussein can mean uh, to all of us. I've been blessed or perhaps cursed with the proclivity to speak about things that are not popular. I don't speak about them because they're not popular. I speak about them because I think they're important and true. And sometimes the most important things about which we need to speak are not popular because there are powers at work in the world that do not wish to have some things known. And these things become taboo and thus unpopular. And the media are the arbiter of these things. We trust the media to give us permission to talk about things. And if the media are not talking about things, then they're not topics for discussion. So if you do not read it in the New York Times, it's not worth reading. We are programmed to think. So I've come to learn that the New York Times does not tell us certain things. I'm not speaking only of the Times, but I'm using it as a cipher for all of the mainstream, military, industrial, corporate-owned media that do not allow certain topics to be brought for public discussion. Australian author Caitlin Johnstone recently wrote that Americans are the most propagandized people on planet Earth. A handful of corporations own the vast majority of all media outlets in the United States. They work 24-7 to sell us on war. And we have been sold. The United States has 800 military bases around the world in virtually every country. The United States spends $1 trillion each year on its military endeavors. 
The United States, with 5% of the world's population, consumes 25% of the world's oil. That's why we have to do numbers one and two. And the United States supports Israel's expansionism and genocide, and our Congress is beholden to Israel's interests through AIPAC and other Israeli-American lobby groups. Since September 11, 2001, the United States has been in continuous war with the world. I'm not going to go on and on about this, but I just want to say this, that this is part of what has driven me on my own spiritual journey. When I point out these facts that are easily verifiable and are common knowledge among most people who are aware, nonetheless, many Americans become angry. They don't want to hear this because it implies that America itself is not exceptional. And we have a belief as Americans, we believe that America is exceptional, exceptionally good, the city on the hill, the light to all the nations. It's deeply rooted in our mythology. And because we believe this, the policies and the goals of the military, industrial, financial, intelligence, media complex are also exceptional. Um, we go to war because it's good for democracy or whatever. We're programmed to think this way. And we believe that the wars in which we've sent women and men to fight and die were all necessary to maintain freedom and justice. And even among those, who realize that the war has left devastation, Americans still support the next one. Why is that? And even though most Americans are against war, because actually Americans, the people, really are good, eventually they happen and they're supported by Americans. And it's due to the propaganda of the media. And when I say media, I mean everything, from television programming to Hollywood movies to news, from both the corporate media giants and the cable stations, the media outlets, including social media, all of that. Because Americans are basically good people, we have to be tricked into war. So in 2010, I became a member of a group called Religious Leaders for 9-11 Truth because I saw that Muslims were being blamed for a crime that they did not commit. And I wrote on the thing you sign, I think it's critically important for religious leaders to demand a complete and thorough investigation surrounding the events of 9-11. It is still used as a pretext for continued so-called wars on terror and the demonization of Muslim people. And I'm not gonna go into all of that, I could. But I'm gonna let you have that. But I'm going to say one person who I deeply admire, and he lives not far from here. He's a Christian theologian, a process theologian, taught at uh, Claremont School of Theology. Lives in Santa Barbara. His name is David Ray Griffin. Wrote a number of books, but in 2004, he started writing about 9-11, and he's wrote about 12 books on this topic. He, uh, his last one is the 9-11 Consensus Panel, um, basically showing which is pretty obvious when anybody actually goes into this, that the official story isn't true. And it is, talking about 9-11 is like taking your head and banging it against a tank. My Presbyterian colleagues won't talk about it. Progressive Christian academics won't talk about it. They won't even give David Ray Griffin a hearing. But anyone who looks at it can see, you just look at architects and engineers for 9-11 truth, but you can't even get people to look at it. So, this is all to lead up to this one point. One day I had coffee, and I broached the topic of 9-11 to a few of my friends at the Islamic Center in Portland. And I tell you, it was refreshing not to be ridiculed and shut down. They knew. That following month, in December 2017, I had a gathering we had in my church to celebrate the birthdays of Prophets Muhammad and Jesus, peace be upon them both. One of the members of the Islamic Center gave me a flyer about an upcoming conference that was called the, um, the U.S.-Saudi Coalition Bringing Peace or War. And I announced the event to my church and I decided to interview a few of the speakers on my radio show, which I did. Uh, the conference was, uh, was uh, organized by a group called uh, Roots of Conflict that saw as its role interfaith work that wanted to go deep into issues, not only just of religion, but also of geopolitics, the things that we are very important for all of us. 
And it was through this event that I met a woman named Zahra Abadi, whose sister Tess attended the Islamic Center of Portland at the time. And Zahra was in the process of organizing the Husseinia Society of, uh, Islamic Society of Seattle. And so she asked me to moderate this conference. And it was at this conference in Portland that I met Kevin Barrett, Jim Fetzer, Scott Bennett, Muhammad al Nimer, Catherine Shakdam, and others. Truth tellers all. And truth tellers who've paid a price for speaking out. And this Roots of Conflict conference in Portland about the U.S.-Saudi coalition and the war in Yemen gave me hope that those who spoke had credibility because they spoke against the deceptions and falsehoods to the extent that they were vilified, lost careers in some cases. They spoke in the spirit of Hussein, and that conference did something for me. It said to me that truth-seeking about controversial political topics can happen and must happen. We shouldn't be afraid of it. Even good can come of it. Because Shias put this on, it told me that Shias knew a lot of truth that the world needs to know, and I should get to know them. It told me that European American Christian pastors like me with privilege need to speak out. And finally, this conference introduced me to Hussein. And after the conference, it was in the course of an email exchange with Zahra and her sister, uh, commenting on the speakers that, they, that this is really kind of did follow in the spirit of Hussein, speaking truth to power, even at risk. And so Zahra invited me to another conference in Seattle for Hussein Day uh, in April 2018 and invited me then to attend Arba'in. She provided a scholarship for me and for my cameraman. She said she was looking for people to send to Arba'in who were searching for what is true. And speaking of what is true, let's talk about Imam Hussein alayhi salam, salawat. To me, Hussein is the model of truth, courage, justice, love, sacrifice for the oppressed against tyranny, anywhere and everywhere. We need Hussein more than ever in these United States. And I say that as a Christian. I'm a Christian who loves Hussein. I want Christian scholars to engage with Shia scholars about Hussein and Jesus, get this conversation started. I didn't know anything about Hussein. And when I began to read a little bit about him, I realized that he is, as I put it at the time, the real thing. I read about Arba'in and became excited about going. And I should say something about Jesus here. I've been a student of the historical Jesus. Now that's not necessarily the Jesus of Christian creed, but the search for the historical Jesus is peeling away the myth from the man, the centuries of, of layers of accretion, and discovering that Jesus was a prophet who resisted the military machine of his own day. It's interesting that Western scholars searching for the historical Jesus found a Jesus that has much in common, as I see it anyway, with the Jesus that is revealed in the Quran and the traditions of the al -Bayt. I saw a reflection of my own, of Jesus in Hussein. So these past two to three years, all this is to say, uh, has been a growing spiritual awareness for me. Uh, and as, as I say, even though I personally had researched 9-11 and, and all of the other things that the military industrial complex has done for some time. I had spoken about it very little, didn't even have these people on my radio show prior to the fall of 2017. Um, and I knew that to do so would result in ridicule and anger, opposition, and it has. But it has also led to great freedom, freedom of the soul. It's scary especially as I became more aware of the involvement of Israel and its methods in silencing people. For example, I tried to have Kevin Barrett after the concert, after the conference on my radio show, and was met with a fierce smear campaign against Dr. Barrett, including all kinds of accusations that were not true. The radio station was harassed with phone calls, social media attacks, 
The station management caved in and wouldn't allow Kevin Barrett to be on my radio show. And that experience caused me to cross a threshold. I got a little taste of what we are up against. And I decided it was necessary for me to be public about what I really think is going on in the world. So I started to write more about militarism and war and the trinity of terrorists in the Middle East, Israel, Saudis, and the United States on my blog and my social media. And so Arba'in meant for me a spiritual pilgrimage. I went with an intent to report back what I had seen uh, in the documentary that you just saw and that Josh and I produced. And I should say something about Josh Townsley, a, a marvelous young man. He uh, packed all his camera equipment, 30 pounds of that on his back <laughs> the whole way. He's, he's a good man. And, uh, and he, he did this filming for me and, uh, and helped me with, uh, with this editing. Um, But I wanted to connect spiritually because to do the work of truth telling, even hesitantly, requires something uh, big, uh, courage. I'm not a courageous person. I'm actually a very nervous kind of person, I'm socially anxious, uh, awkward. I'm not a warrior, I'm a worrier. But these last couple of years have made me more spiritually aware than I have been in the past. And so Arba'in ended up being for me, it kind of it fell into place, but it fell into place of needing to find uh, a spiritual direction, a, mor a moral compass here, and to connect with people who have been vilified by the media again and again, uh, to set to do whatever part I could to try to set the record straight. So that's how I got to go to Arabi, and that's, that's the back story. It's probably more than uh, Sayyid Mustafa really asked for. Um, but the story is this. It's a story of deep concern for the world and for my country. And it started because I, broke to con I broached a controversial topic with my Shia friends and they embraced me for doing so. And they said, we can talk about that. To the visit itself, when Josh, my cameraman, uh, and I went, we participated in the tour led by Milana Beg. You saw in the video, uh, Sister Zara thought that the tour would be good. Uh, he could get us into the checkpoints with our cameras and, and whatnot. And I sat at Milana Beg's feet and listened to his sermons. He talked every day. Each sermon would end with tears. Uh, with crying and, and uh, matam. And I didn't feel this emotion at first. Uh, one day we learned about Abbas, another day we learned about uh, Zainab, another day Ali Asghar, and so forth. Uh, one day we learned about the, the Christian uh, who came and fought alongside uh, Hussein at the battle. Uh, and, and at each time the sermon would end, people would, would, would cry. And I didn't feel any tears until the end of the two weeks. It was on the day of Arba'in itself, after the walk, that it all caught up with me emotionally. For two weeks, I saw people crying all the time. Now, people weren't crying all the time, but for two weeks, you saw people crying. So why are they crying? Well, they're crying for Hussein. They're crying for his companions, the Alu Bayt, but they're, yes, but I also thought they're also crying for the injustice of this world, too. Well, the crying didn't hit me until the last sermon by Molana Beg. And, uh, and this is not in the film. But he was telling the story of the people who were late to the battle, who didn't make it in time, who too late to help. And Molana Beg says, that's who we are. We're too late. We missed it. We cannot go help Hussein in the battle. All we can do now is to say what happened, to bear witness to what happened, to report back truth. And that just hit me and I broke down. Maybe that's what I can do. I'm too late for most everything to be much help, but I can bear witness. 
I can say what I think is true if I have the courage of Hussein in my heart, inshallah. And that's what all of this meant to me, touching the shrine, going on the walk, visiting the other shrines of the imams and the alobait, experiencing the whole of the event. This city, Karbala, beaten down, yet so proud, like a mother, so abused, so filled with pain, yet arms wide open, welcoming all of her children from all over the world. Myself being welcomed, hugged, fed, I experienced that, being told again and again that Hussein is for everyone, even you. You white American, you're okay. As a Christian, Hussein's for you too. The pictures of the young martyrs on each of the poles between Najaf and Karbala killed defending their shrines in their home against Dash. Who is this Dash anyway? Who sponsors these mercenaries? I think we know. This movement, this wave, this river of beautiful people, this awakening, people rising up, rising up, children, old women, old men, young women, young men, people from all over the world, some walking hundreds of kilometers, some without any shoes, people working all day, all night to feed people. The constant phrase shouted out, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Labek, Ya Hussein. The spontaneity of it is a divine response to the organized violence that has caused so much suffering across the Middle East. Organized by lies and propaganda of powers that have invaded Iraq, destroyed so much of it, yet Arba'in responds with generosity. It is hospitality, it is graciousness, it is truth, it is goodness, it is love. And that's what gave me hope and gives me hope. There's no stopping this. What can I say about this experience? What did I discover? Arba'in is the symbol of the path toward redemption of our world. Arba'in is the symbol of the path of salvation for our world. Who will save us? Who will save our world? Who will lead us to salvation? To a world our babies can inhabit when they're our age. What I learned is it certainly won't be me. I won't lead it. The rich are not going to lead this. Empires will not lead this. Militaries won't lead this. Governments won't. It will be led by those the so-called powers of this world ignore, suppress, and distort. It will be led by the people rising up and following the love of Hussein. The young woman in the video uh, talked about every day as Ashura and every place as Karbala. It doesn't mean at all to say less of actual Ashura and Karbala, but as to say it's perhaps a mirror that every day we have the commitment. Every day there is suffering somewhere. And wherever we are, we're called to take notice. Take notice of our own moral compass. Where is it pointed? Reset it, recommit to it. I discovered that my understanding of Jesus is not that unlike that of Hussein. They're on the same team, along with Musa and Abraham and all of the prophets and all of the imams. They have the same goals. They live in the same love, can't we all? Jews, Christians, Muslims. And finally, this experience for me was joy. The story of Karbala is a tragedy. Yes, mourning. But that lament, is, is, it clears the soul. Mourning leads to joy. Malana Beg said, Karbala, uh, uh, Arba'in is a gift wrapped in grief. Mourning leads as it always must to joy. The ultimate victor, not Yazid, we just talked at lunch today. There's no, what, Arba'in for him and his minions who make the world suffer. The ultimate victor is Hussein who lives within each of us and who summons the entire world to love. 
The people of Iraq have given me a glimpse of what that love looks like, and for that I'm eternally grateful. I'm not sure what's next. I want to continue to build relationships with family, a new family here of Shias, learn more about the Shia intellectual tradition, and perhaps communicate to Christians how Hussein and Jesus might be a bridge in regards to enacting justice and dismantling this war machine. I know it is more dangerous for Shias in America, especially people of color, to speak out against this military industrial complex and controversial issues. Um, I have a privilege being, being white and I feel the need to use that privilege to break taboos. I think there are many more people who think like I do, but we need people to trailblaze, and give permission, and I believe it's critical for all of us to speak about the roots of our conflicts so that we might make positive change. In the documentary, Milana Begg said that um, the spon this walk was spontaneous. We don't know what it means yet. Some kind of divine movement, but we don't know. We just trust it at this point. I believe that the spirit of Hussein is now speaking to the whole world. It's a movement of truth and toward justice. I'm going to close with a short piece that I wrote uh, just last couple of weeks ago for my local paper. Uh, I wrote this just after uh, we narrowly had that uh, Trump almost bombed Iran, pulled out at the last minute, thankfully. It's the Beaverton Resource Guide. I was supposed to write something uplifting in 250 words. So I thought I'd write about my trip to Arba'in. So I'll share with you with this, this with you because this is the kind of thing I think that needs to be said whenever we have the opportunity to say it. This is what I wrote. Last October, I had the honor of participating in the largest annual peaceful human gathering in the world. It's called Arba'in. During a two-week period, 15 million people, some estimates are as high as 20 to 30 million, visit the shrine of Imam Hussein the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad in Karbala, Iraq. People walk from Najaf to Karbala, a 50-mile walk, have all their needs met. Food, water, a place to sleep at night, anything they might need to make a successful visit. I came as a Christian pastor from America to show my respect for Hussein and for his sacrifice on behalf of justice and truth. I made a film about the trip, you can find it on YouTube, called For Love of Hussein. I walked the 50 miles over the two and a half days and touched the shrine of Hussein. I participated in the rituals of mourning and made friends with people from Iraq, Iran, India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia, just a few of over the 60 nations represented. These faithful Muslims heeding the call of Hussein to stand with the oppressed of the world opened my mind and my heart. What I came away with was a renewed sense of hope for humankind. When a Christian pastor from America is showered with love and hospitality from Shia Muslims in Iraq and Iran, you can't help but be hopeful. I wish all Americans could share this experience of unity. A just peace is coming for all of Earth. People get ready. Inshallah. Wa alaikum as -salam.